To our surprise, it is Mrs. Coates who meets us at the door next day. Yes, yes, please come in, but you should know that Robert is not in the best of moods. Nevertheless, Emma Coates insists we enter. She says her husband very much looks forward to our visits and is most keen to look at our brushes. Brushes? Perhaps you mean rushes, Mrs. Coates? Ah, yes, just so. I don't claim to understand any of it, Miss Singleton, but that is fine. I leave that kind of thing to my husband. You're sure it's okay for us to come in? Yes, yes, it will cheer Robert up. Mr. Coates' dress is understated this day. For him, on me, they would be clothes to wear if I were a circus performer. He wears a black band around his arm. The windows are all shuttered. He is slumped in his chair. No doubt you will have heard. Oh, weeping away, sir. Oh, such an inglorious end. And such a fine, fine woman. Catherine was too young to die. And to die of a broken heart, I am quite convinced. Catherine, tell me long. Dear, dear woman, a precious rose gone now. It's a deep tragedy. We can come back another day. No, no. Mr. Coates thrusts out a hand, much like young Othello back in Antigua. One must be strong. Catherine would wish it so. We must not think only of ourselves. The memoir must be completed at all costs. He dabs an eye, then blows into his hanky. It's very loud, theatrical. Yet I don't doubt its sincerity. Please, my good friends, let us steal our hearts and continue. If you're sure, Mr. Coates. I am sure, Miss Singleton. Janet raises her eyebrows. Moving from interviews with the friar to interviews with Mr. Coates is like crossing half a dozen different time zones in an instant. Over to you, Fred. Um, you have our deepest sympathies, sir. I thank you, Mr. Pruitt. With your permission, could we revisit the year 1813? Certainly, Mr. Pruitt. Do you remember the play At Home? Indeed I do, sir. Mr. Matthews' play. What did you think of it? Mr. Coates brightens and rises from his slump. I remember I had a very good box seat. As for the play itself, it was quite amusing and well attended. The debut, certainly. What do you remember about the play specifically? Well, Charles Matthews was a notorious comic in his time. So, needless to say, the play was quite amusing. And the plot? Let me see. It was some years ago now. Um, there's this Captain Dash and his paramour, um, Emily, I believe was the name. And, and there was a rival lover, of course, whose name um, I can't recall. In any case, Captain Dash is invited one and all to his place for an evening of amateur theatre. And among the guests is a certain... Romeo Rantel? Exactly, sir. You've seen the play? I know of it. Uh, portrayed by Charles Matthews, of course. Extraordinary mimic. Did I already mention this? It is said, Mr. Coates, that the Romeo Rantel character was meant to be a parody of you. Oh, it's quite likely was, Mr. Pruitt. I look for a facial twitch, some hint of annoyance, but there's nothing. R.C. folds his hands on his lap. The audience seemed to enjoy the play immensely. And the Romeo Rantel character, he was costumed in a manner very similar to you? Uh, not as fine, of course. No real diamonds, but a reasonable facsimile, all in all. And his speech, his idioms? Uh, they resembled mine passably well. Yet you took no offense? Of course not, Mr. Pruitt. You have heard the expression, imitation is a kind of artless flattery. <laughs> it was a case in point. There is more I might bring to the table, but think better of it. For example, how Charles Matthews stretched out his dying scene, which R.C. was famous for, and how, as he lay dying, he would thrust his leg outward toward the audience so all could have a good view of his diamond-studded shoe buckle. But I suspect R.C. would dismiss these antics as just more examples of artless flattery. We have succeeded at least in making R.C. temporarily forget about his dear Catherine. He is beaming now, close to chuckling. 
at, at one point in the performance, Mr. Matthews notices me sitting in my box, uh, right at stage level. Oh, what a moment it is. He stops what he is doing and walks over and greets me, takes my hand. <laughs> Very gentlemanly of him. And what do you do? Why, well, shake his hand back, of course, and then I stand and bow. <laughs> the crowd goes mad. So you're not at all bothered by this experience? <laughs> not at all, sir. Even though the following day many papers come to your defense, one publication calling the play a malignant satire, another writes, at home is despicable, it is despicable on the stage, despicable in writing, despicable in conception, and despicable in principle. Well, it, it did have a relatively short run. <laughs> that pretty much takes care of the day's question, so uh, Linda asks Mr. Coates if he's ready to have a look at the rushes. I am indeed, Miss Henderson. He takes tiny, cautious steps, approaching Linda's camera, as though ready to witness one of Davy's experiments in electricity. Ah! Oh. I'm still so small. We can make your image bigger. Excellent. We can make it life-size, in fact. Even bigger, Mr. Coates. We could fill the entire side of a building with your image if we wanted to. Larger than life. Well, I, I'm not sure that's necessary. Next day is crazy. We have bills to pay, and Linda insists she has to make an appearance at her niece's birthday party, if only briefly. When we do finally make it to London, the sun is already sinking, and Mr. and Mrs. Coates are just stepping out. Ah, Mr. Pruitt, we had assumed you were unavoidably detained. Mr. Coates sports a walking stick this day. It's very fancy, and has, no surprise, diamonds embedded around its knob. I try to imagine people from my own era in the scene. Liberace, Elton John, many others, in fact. As we watch other pedestrians pass, it becomes clear, however, that R.C.'s choice of clothes is, at best, passé. It is not just we who do double takes. What was high fashion ten years before seems no longer to be the case. By contrast, Mrs. Coates looks modestly stylish, and she, I think, is in no danger of crossing into the land of the outlandish. Emma whispers to her husband, who nods several times with increasing enthusiasm. Excellent idea, my dear. Yes, of course. Mr. Coates pauses, takes a deep breath, then chooses from my guest to be a large catalogue of dramatic poses. Uh, Mr. Pruitt, uh, ladies, would you do us the honour of accompanying us to Harrington House this evening? Viscount Petersham's place. That sounds wonderful, Mr. Coates, but we don't wish to. Oh, stuff and nonsense, sir. You would be most welcome, and it is high time you met some of my good friends, who uh, no doubt deserve a place of honour in my memoir. First and foremost, of course, is the Viscount himself, whom I feel certain I've mentioned more than once in passing. Uh, it will be a corky evening, I promise you. Only playwrights, actors, and musicians permitted. And, uh, do you call yourselves again? Filmmakers. And filmmakers. The arts will shine, sir. And then, too, there is Dr. Kitchener, who will dazzle you with his cuisine. Dr. Kitchener? A king in the kitchen, if you take my meaning. Wait until you taste his wow-wow sauce, sir. <laughs> it is exceptional. Of course, that settles it. The lure of wow-wow sauce alone. We arrive by carriage at dusk. Harrington House is large, and as R.C. warned us, its interior is painted brown, only brown, so that even with a multitude of candles and lanterns on shelves, it is very dark inside. We can fix a lot in post-processing. We are presented as foreign curiosities from America, possessors of odd contraptions that can record image and voice with miraculous fidelity, as R.C. describes it. They will show you all that later. R.C. promises. But first, the introductions. Viscount Petersham, who everyone is calling Charles, is much as we had been led to believe, eccentric, mild-mannered, and kind. He greets us with a shy, bowed head and slight lisp. His handshake is on the limpy side, and he often finds it difficult to look us in the eye. Nevertheless, he is eager to give us a tour, focusing especially on his collection of snuff boxes. 
He has hundreds, each one unique, many of which he claims to have personally designed. In the midst of the tour, the Viscount stops to take a pinch from his box. Mr. Coates is quick to admire the box's artistry. You are most kind, Robert. Yes, it is a nice spring box, but it would not do for summer wear, of course. No, 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 of course. We are each offered a pinch of our own, but only Mr. Coates partakes. What is it with Mr. Coates and the Viscount? What do you mean? They're pretty chummy chummy, don't you think? What are you implying? Don't forget what century we're in. And don't forget who we're talking about. It's all about connection. Linda and I are obviously too stupid to understand, so Janet continues. It's all about getting close to the king, rubbing shoulders with royalty, the ultimate aim of any Regency gentleman. The king? Viscount Petersham is close friends with the Prince Regent, and Mr. Coates is close friends with the Viscount, so... Ah, I say, pretending to finally understand the mystery of English class structure. It's even more than that. Viscount Petersham, uh, George, is gentleman of the bedchamber to the king. Has been for some time. <laughs> what? Seriously, Linda? It just means that the Viscount is one of the few in the realm who has direct access to the king's ear. And other parts of the king's anatomy? Jesus, Linda. Just saying. Joining our tour is Maria Foote, a quite famous actress, though I've never heard of her. She's quite stunning. Someone who is definitely accustomed to being stared at, and yet seemingly comfortable with the experience. In our century, if she did not find work in film, she would certainly have worked as a model. Also present is Sir Lumley Skiffington, who impresses me as the most well-mannered man I have ever met. More than his politeness and general friendliness, though, I am struck by just how easily the man moves from conversation to conversation, knowing just what tone to strike. All done so effortlessly, the epitome of charm. The goddamn Jane Austen hero, as Janet puts it. Yet, somehow, he is a bachelor. R.C. tells us that among his many accomplishments, Mr. Skiffington is a renowned playwright, which he denies instantly. But you are, George. I may have penned one or two things. Finally, there is Dr. Kitchener, the great extrovert among us. He is a well-known optician and an accomplished musician, but his greatest fame seems to come from his work in the kitchen. In our own day, Dr. Kitchener would likely have had his own TV show. His book, The Cook's Oracle, is a bestseller, we're told, in both England and America. I make note to check if it's still in print when we get home. After our tour, Dr. Kitchener proudly displays what he calls his Traveling Culinary Cabinet. Inside, wrapped in their individual leather pockets, are dozens of mysterious bottles, his special sauces and condiments. I can only hope that one of them is full of wawa sauce. Not only does Dr. Kitchener prepare the meal, he also serves the dishes and promises that afterwards it is he alone who will do the cleanup. We need to kidnap that man and bring him home with us. We sit around the great oblong table, and it is clear that the Viscount has given careful thought to the seating arrangements. For all his superficial shyness, Janet tells me the Viscount is something of a ladies' man. He sits at the far end of our table, with Janet on his right and the glamorous Maria Foote on his left. He alone is surrounded by women on both sides. The Viscount has a thing about actresses. As for the rest of us, it is pretty much a boy-girl-boy -boy arrangement. I sit between Janet and Linda. On the opposite side of the table, Mrs. Coates sits between her husband and Sir Lumley. The up-and-down doctor sits at the head of the table. The meal is pretty good, by English standards, and I discover that Dr. Kitchener's wawa sauce is basically just a spicy kind of ketchup. I have 19 different recipes, but wow-wow is my favorite. It's delicious. Can I take some back with me? You may, my dear. Please promote it widely in the Americas. I will. No one is filming the dinner, which is a pity because I would really, really like to have had a record of Linda licking Regency Wawa sauce from her fingers. Oh, have you tried these? She crunches the delicacy between her teeth, and one can't help but recall that famous scene from When Harry Met Sally. There, Fred, sits the great man who invented the potato chip. Excuse me, miss? 
What do you call them? My crisps. You, you called them potato what? Potato chips. But crisps is good too. After dinner, Miss Foot sings a song that might have been written specifically for her. I can't help but notice how intently the Viscount watches her. The doctor accompanies her on the pianoforte. When young and thoughtless Laura said, "No one shall win my heart," but little dreamt the simple maid of love's delusive art. At ball or play, she flirt away and ever giddy be, but always said, "I ne'er will wed. No one shall govern me. No, 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 no one shall govern me." And now, let us prevail upon Mister Coates. We're all dying to hear something from. What shall it be, ladies and gentlemen? The fair penitent. Mister Coates needs no persuading. His face is beaming as he slowly scans the room. And may I prevail upon another to lead me into the death scene? You, Mister Pruitt, you have trod the boards before, sir. You have confessed as much. But I, I don't know the play. Oh, fear not, sir. I carry a copy. Page forty-seven, sir. You are Altamont, my arch enemy, and I have betrayed you by seducing Callista, your wife. Damn, I think. And this is one of R. C.'s favorite roles. Ready? You don't need to record this, guys. But, But we, we must. What the hell? When in London, I do a few quick lip stretches and take a deep breath. As the much wronged Altamont, I scowl and begin. Thou hast talked too much. Thy breath is poison to me. It taints the ambient air. This for my father. This for Ciotto, and this last for Altamont. Excellent. Well done, Mister Pruitt. Mister Coates then takes up a fencing position. My lines are done. I have no idea what he wants me to do next. We must fight, sir. Altamont and Lothario must take to sword. With his bent arm and invisible sword, Mister Coates chops at the air in my general direction. You can do it, Fred. I slice the air in the general direction of Mister Coates, who yells suddenly as if I have mortally wounded him. Strike me again! A second time, I cleave a section of air. The rest I leave to Mister Coates. Oh, Altamont, thy genius is the stronger. Thou hast prevailed. R.C. staggers forward, hand clutched to his chest. Still filming, Linda steps deftly to her left. My fierce, ambitious soul, declining, droops, and all her fires grow pale. Lothario takes three more staggering steps, then glances up toward the heaven he will never see. It is clear the villain will not die quickly. He twists his head backward and shares a villainous snarl. Yet let not this advantage swell thy pride. Conquered in my turn, in love I triumphed. Lothario drops to his knees. The end, one hopes, seems near. Those joys are lodged beyond the reach of fate. That sweet revenge comes smiling to my thoughts, adorns my fall. And cheers my heart in dying. It's not the worst acting I've ever seen, but I have to reconsider when I see Mister Coates quickly wipe the floor with his handkerchief before falling flat on his back in his final limb-shaking death spasm. Twice I am convinced he's dead. After the third shake, he truly is. The rest is silence. Until the following thundering applause, when Mister Coates jumps sprightly to his feet and says, "Shall I do it again?" This is only the start to the night's entertainment. For in Regency England, everyone is expected to contribute. Solemnly, Skiffington recites an original poem, and it's quite good, despite the man's many apologies. Linda and Janet too are asked to entertain, but play their get-out-of-jail-free card by promising to share rushes before the night is through. 
Mrs. Coates, too, is given a special exemption, everyone seeming to recognize that her husband's contributions are more than enough. Well, then, who has a clever anecdote to share? I do. Mr. Coates looses a coat button and steps into the middle of the room. At a West End club, certain gentlemen were disturbed from their game by a young waif beseeching them for a pinch of salt. Salt? said one of the gentlemen. What do you want salt for? Another remark. Boy, you don't appear to have anything to eat with it. No, replied the poor urchin. That is just my misfortune. But I hope that if you gave me the salt, one of the other gentlemen would perhaps give me an egg or something else to eat it with. <laughs> The parlor roars with laughter, though not from me, nor Janet, nor Linda. How strange what a Regency audience considers an amusing anecdote. The punchline follows. <laughs> the, the gentleman was so pleased by the boy's ready wit, they ordered him a breakfast from the kitchen at once. <laughs> My confusion over the room's laughter I can only compare with the mystery of why the French like Jerry Lewis or my grandfather Red Skelton. But chacun a son goût, I guess. Especially in music and comedy. Shortly after, Viscount Petersham's guests gather around the dinner table to look at the evening's rushes. There are the expected oohs and ahs as the guests recognize their faces and voices. That's me. <laughs> Though, of course, I'm much larger in real life. Extraordinary! And you can play the sequence back, you say? Linda demonstrates. There are gasps and shrieks as the guests watch themselves move double time in reverse. And where did you say you're from? America. It seems we may have significantly underestimated the colonies. Former colonies? Uh, indeed, madam. Uh, my profound apologies. To consider what they're seeing as sorcery or some kind of spiritualism is only reasonable under the circumstances, so I'm not in the least surprised to find Emma Coates clutching her husband's arm as she watches. Miss Foote does much the same, only with the Viscount. In her case, however, I suspect her motives have nothing to do with fright. And what do you call this? A film. A video. Video! Oh, yes, I see. Oh, very good. Sir Lumley Skiffington nods and smiles. Nothing like a piece of Latin to reassure an upper-crust Englishman. When the initial mood of amazement dies down, Mr. Coates asks if it's not too much trouble that we play back Lothario's death scene. There are more oohs and ahs, followed by applause on screen and off. <laughs> it's well done, is it not? Everyone assures Mr. Coates it is, but he asks to see it one more time so that he may give thought to his intonation on a particular line. Not bad, but I do think the playwright falls a little short here. Oh, one is tempted to alter the line. Next, Linda fast-forwards to a conversation between Mr. Coates and Miss Foote. Their two heads fill the frame. And what would you say is your favourite role? Whichever one I am presently playing. <laughs> but you must have a favourite. Something from the Bard's repertoire, perhaps? Everyone is following this exchange with extreme interest. I realize at last that no one present, except for R.C. and Miss Foote, has heard this conversation before, and that R.C. and Miss Foote must have thought their words were confidential. What is this sorcery, they must be thinking, that can permit the recording of private conversations? Linda has obviously zoomed in to the max, and picking up Linda's cue, Janet has aimed her telescopic mic in the appropriate direction. Back in 1815, I played roles in several of Shakespeare's plays, but that was some time ago, Mr. Coates. We can see every crease in R.C.'s face. I doubt he is pleased about this. Uh, which roles, dear Miss Foote? Miranda, for one. Lovely. Lady Percy and Henry V. Ah, yes. And Helena and Midsummer. I can only imagine, Miss Foote. Uh, you would have been a magnificent Helena. And yourself, Mr. Coates? The camera doesn't lie. For all her good manners, Miss Foote seems increasingly bored by this conversation, 
She makes less and less eye contact and seems eager for some excuse to leave. Of course, R.C. notices none of this. 1815 was a particularly quiet year for me. Uh, What with all that fuss about Napoleon and Elba and so forth. However, all things considered, I would have to say my favorite role was Romeo. Here, R.C. pauses to take another pinch of snuff, a procedure that looks mildly disgusting in close-up. R.C. blinks his eyes several times before continuing. Lothario, Belcour, um, they were interesting, certainly, but nothing quite compares with Romeo. Of course. And uh, am I to understand, Miss Foote, that you are presently playing at Covent Garden? I am, sir. Letitia Hardy and Bell's stratagem. Then I must see it. You would honor me, sir. The Viscount moves into frame. Miss Foote rises. The Viscount takes her hand. The camera follows them as they leave the room, and we see Viscount Petersham put a hand on the lady's waist. The scene suddenly switches to the kitchen, changing the reaction of the audience from gasps to cheers. Dr. Kitchener is giving a lesson about condiments, and from behind the camera, Linda is encouraging him to display his bottle of wow-wow sauce. Janet must have taken over the camera at this point, because uh, then we see the doctor and Linda standing together, holding a bottle of the famous condiment. They mug before the camera shamelessly and say together, Wow, 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 making this the first and only, I hope, Regency infomercial. Next, the scene shifts to Emma Coates, a woman who until this moment has been pretty much a mystery. Janet holds the microphone close to her face, but then backs off when she sees how this unnerves the woman. So you and Mr. Coates first met in France? That is so, Miss Singleton. What brought you... And then there is nothing. The screen is a terrifying black. What the hell? Oh, shit. We make our quick goodbyes, explaining we'll catch our own carriage. We promise to see Mr. and Mrs. Coates anon, and hurry for the door, delayed at the last moment by Dr. Kitchener, who bows and delicately places a bottle of wow-wow sauce into Linda's hands. I have to nudge her to remind her to say thank you. Once outside... Janet begins pacing back and forth. So what are we going to do now? Janet keeps asking the same question, or variations of it, often liberally peppered with four-letter words. Finally, Linda pulls the discharged battery from the gap between her breasts. She places it between her palms and begins rubbing. Come on! Come on! It's dark out. We can hear the footclops of a distant horse-drawn carriage, and the fog is rolling in. I wish Linda would hurry, because I'm having trouble not thinking about werewolves and Jack the Ripper. There! Linda plops the battery back into the camera, and Shazam! The power light suddenly flashes on. Two percent. Two percent? Is that enough? Thankfully, two percent is enough. Back in her Toronto bedroom at 3 a.m., Janet is still upset. How could you? Linda's sulking in the living room, happy to have a wall between us. I'm sorry. How could you let the battery run down like that? Honestly, Janet, I was watching it, but... I thought you said you always carried an extra. Yes, I, I always do, except this time... This time what? I gently put a hand on Janet's elbow. Not even a whole hand, just two fingers. Take it easy. Just help me out of this goddamn corset, will you? I nod, look away, and continue unlacing. I feel like I'm diffusing a buzz bomb. I forgot, Janet. I'm sorry. I guess I must have left the battery in my other pants. Linda, that's so... Unprofessional? Yes. Finally, Janet is free of her corset. She takes in a deep breath, and I like to think she is counting silently to ten. But I did get us back, right? Eventually. I knew if we just warmed up the battery, usually that works. After chamomile tea and a good deal of cat petting, we're able to discuss future plans a little more rationally. That talk between you and Mrs. Coates, it was so important. I just had to make sure we got it. It was starting to get quite revealing, wasn't it? It was amazing. 
And if Mr. Coates hadn't come along when he did, who's telling what other secrets we might have learned? The Renards all round. I feel we are close to getting all the material we need, but we're not quite there yet. I do apologize about the rushes, but they were all so keen and... Well, you should have seen the look on Sir Lumley's face. He just couldn't get enough. Not to mention Dr. Kitchener. What are you talking about? Oh, come on, Linda. Even Fred noticed. Not true, but I nod nonetheless. He was completely gaga over you. <laughs> or should I say, wow, wow? Not in a million years. We all laugh. Then Janet rises suddenly. Enough with this stupid chamomile. I'm going for the Chardonnay. Drinks are poured. Even I take a glass this time. So the question is, do we dare go back? We have to go back. You're not concerned about the camera? Camera's fine, except for being stuck on 1825. And I'm recharging the battery as we speak. And this time, I'll be in charge of the backup battery. Fair enough. And besides, who's to say that my boobs aren't warmer than yours? Obviously, I make no comment whatsoever. You're absolutely sure the battery is 100% charged? Absolutely. And you have the backup, Janet? Nestled between my knockers. Really? <laughs> Maybe in your dreams, Fred. Okay, so we've got our plan straight, right? Because this might be our last time. Last time for this goddamn corset, I hope. I can understand why a corset might be uncomfortable. I really can, but at least women don't have to wear these ridiculous, poofy pantaloons. I suppose I should count myself lucky a red clown nose is not part of the gear. Oh well, no sacrifice, no art, I guess. Everyone ready? Linda nods, but nothing happens. Is there a problem? I'm waiting for the word, Fred. What word? The word, you know. Oh, for God's sake, Linda, energize! <laughs>